flight simulator. Thursday you're going to be building the rockets, and Friday shooting them off, testing them, flying. Okay. Semi to space. So, good morning, rocket engineers. Good morning. This is what you're going to become after the next four days. Uh, you guys know us because we uh, we taught you solar cars, and uh, this is our latest course, and it really is uh, focused on a study of Newton's laws of motion, as well as a number of other things relating to rockets, like aerodynamic forces. And um, so let's see, you know most of us already. Um, I'm Stu Wecker, I'm a computer scientist, and uh, I develop software for, um, for computer networks and work on things like the routing algorithm in the internet. And then we have with us also Dave. I'm, I'm Dave or David, either one's fine. And um, I was an engineer for 40 years. And I worked at uh, Bell Labs in New Jersey, and Motorola, and Intel, and worked on things like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Most of my technology is wireless, things that have to do with radio. It was a hobby for me since I was a kid. Had a great time in engineering, and I got to tell you, this is one of our best classes. You have a really good time. How high can these rockets go, Stu? These rockets go over 300 feet high. That's tall. That is way up. That's just about out of sight. Okay. And we have with us, we have Charles Levinsky. Hi. Yeah, I, I used to teach at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, and then a little bit at ASU when I retired. Then I retired again, so now I'm happy to be back in class. And we have one real rocket engineer with us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michael. Yes. That's Carl. <laughs> Carl worked on a lot of rocket engine development. No, Carl. My, yeah, my name is Carl Camilli. I'm a retired rocket scientist. I worked on those rockets that you heard of and lots you have. Saturn V, to put the man on the moon I worked on. The Apollo capsule, I did some work on that. Also did work on Tomahawk, which you just heard recently, uh, it's being used over in Libya. Uh, all launch vehicles, including the space shuttle, uh, and different missile systems. So, thank you. Great. So our focus today, and this thing let me advance. Um, you know what? I've never used it there. Does anybody know? You could touch it. Touch it. Just, touch the, just touch the board. I know, but it's easier actually for me to hang on to this. Try something. Try something. Okay. There's always a kid who jumps up. Yeah, they'll show it. I'll do it. I'll do it. No, you can't. Uh, really? Okay, I can, I can do it. Let's just say the arrow. I can do it. Okay. I'll stand on this side. It's easier. Okay, so what we're going to study today, I'm not getting sound. Uh, Small technical glitch. I should be getting sound. One second. One second. Sorry, David. Um, The other blue, thank you, that uses the principles of rocket, that was a rocket in its truest definition. So, I'm sure you've all done that before. T minus 16 seconds, okay. South suppression water system has been activated. Okay, it does work, okay. Okay, I think we're good, okay. So, I said we're going to focus on Newton's laws of motion as our primary science, but then we're going to study a lot of engineering about rockets. And we're going to talk all about what makes them fly and what makes them fly true and straight, because that's what's going to be really important to you guys when you actually build your rockets. Okay? And, uh... And I want to thank the, uh... We have, for this class, we have to thank the United States government and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. 
not only for all the material that we're using in this class, which is where most of it comes from, but we also have to thank the United States government for all the money that they put into research and development, getting us to the moon, getting us into space to build the, uh, the International Space Station. And without any of that, um, we actually wouldn't have a lot of scientific developments that we have because of that. Protecting well, discovery of the launch pad from crucible. So we're taking a look at a launch of the uh, yeah, we'll space engine discovery. Start minus five, which flew, four, came three, back last two, week for its final one. flight. Booster ignition and liftoff of discovery, hoisting harmony to the heavens and opening new gateways for international science. We'll discovery has cleared the tower. More about the space shuttle. A little bit later on. Roger roll, Discovery. Discovery's roll maneuver is complete. It's now in a head-down position on track for its flight to the International Space Station. And this is, as we'll talk later, probably man's greatest achievement in building machines. And we'll, we'll get into all the details of about the space shuttle later. But our objective in this course, and our whole reason for being here, is to get all of you really excited about wanting to become scientists or engineers. Because all the, the four of us here, we already have done this, and we're always excited about science and engineering. And here we are, old guys, and we're still excited about science and engineering. And so we're going to explore the science of rocketry, primarily Newton's laws. We're going to talk all about engineering, which is how you apply that science and how you actually build rockets that fly true and straight and all about the technology that makes that happen. But in addition to that, we're really going to explore the engineering process. We're actually going to take you through exactly what real engineers do in designing and building rockets. And that means they first learn all of the theory, which we're going to do today, but then we're actually going to be using a computer simulator written by NASA to help you design your rocket. You're actually going to take this simulator and design the fins and the shape of the rocket, and then you're actually going to fly it on the simulator, and you're going to make little changes until you get the rocket just the way you want it, and then you're actually going to build from what you actually designed. So that's actually the really neat part. We're going to take you through that whole process of designing and building and testing, and then actually launching these rockets. And in addition, you're going to learn to work together as a team. How many, uh, how many people work on the, uh, on the shuttle program? Oh, hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of people. And they all have to work together. And that's what you're going to be working in teams of two to build these rockets. And you're both going to have to contribute. You're both going to have to put your best thoughts and efforts into building this. So, Team effort and working as a team is really important. And you're going to learn how rockets work, and you're going to get a lot of insight into the science that actually makes this work. So sort of even a little more than Isaac Newton, who figured out when an apple fell on his head what was going on, you're going to actually get a little more of an intuitive feel what's going on when you actually build these rockets. So let's start by uh, talking about what is a rocket. What is a rocket? Somebody must have some idea. I just showed you a launch. So come on, what's a rocket? Well, what makes a rocket different from an airplane? Yeah? You go straight up. Go straight up? No. No, I can build rocket cars. Um, that'll go horizontally, and a lot of rockets can fly at an angle. Um, no, it's not the direction they travel. Come on, what, what makes a rocket different for an airplane? <laughs> Go ahead. It goes higher. Goes higher. Um, that's true, but why? You got, you got, you got the beginnings of an idea. Yeah. Because the fuel rockets. Because what? Because the fuel rockets. The fuel. Yeah. Okay. Take it a little yeah, further. Getting really close. Come on, you got the idea. <laughs> yeah. Come on, what's the difference? Airplanes have fuel also. It has a bigger what? Um, not necessarily. Probably, but not necessarily. But besides, what do you need to make fuel burn? 
What do you need? Yeah. You need air, right? Yeah. What happens when you get into space? Is there any air? No. 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 So, what, so how does a rocket work in space? Carries, carries its own air. That's what makes it a rocket. What makes it a rocket is that it's self-contained. Okay? It's propelled by a rocket engine, and the, the key element of a rocket engine is that it's all self-contained. The rocket has basically two things in it. Pretty much, if you, if you take away the outer shell, what you find is two big tanks inside the rocket. One is fuel, and the other is an oxidizer, basically oxygen, which makes the fuel burn. And so a rocket doesn't need any air from the outside. That's what makes it different from an air. Airplanes can only go so high. Airplanes fly at about 30,000, 35,000 feet, because that's about the limit. Because as fast as they fly, they're taking in as much air as they can. They just can't fly any higher, because there's not enough air for them. But rockets can go anywhere they want. They can operate on Earth. They can operate in space. They even can be fired underwater from submarines. They can actually start their flight underwater and then come right up out of the water. Okay? And rocket engines can be built using all kinds of energy sources. You can use chemical sources or nuclear or solar. Um, you can use lots of things to power it. But what's important is that whatever fuel they use, whatever it needs to burn that fuel, has to be on board the rocket. Okay, now we've been sort of, um, the, the whole Earth has been enamored with space travel and the idea of looking up into the heavens and seeing the stars for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, way back, even before we sent our first astronaut up into space or our first satellite into space, there were books written all about space travel going way back into the 1940s. This is an illustration, I think, from maybe a story by science fiction writers like Isaac Asimov. He used to write lots of stories about space travel. And everybody knows Star Trek? And Star Trek's been around now for like 40 or, 40 or more years. And all this stuff used to be fiction, but that's all changed. Because now we regularly have astronauts going up to the space station and coming back down. And so this middle picture is a picture of a real astronaut. But you can't tell it. It used to be 40 years ago. Everybody knew this was fiction. You can't tell anymore. But that's a real picture of a real astronaut in space. And so now we've come to the point that we've taken what we used to write about 40 and 50 years ago, and we've actually turned it into reality. Now, history of rockets go. Did I skip one? No. No. I'll go way back to uh, this guy Hero, who was a uh, Greek philosopher and mathematician, and he built this little gadget called Hero's Engine. And Hero's Engine, he had this little tub of water, and when he heated that tub of water, the water would turn into uh, steam which would go up this tube and into this globe, and then the steam would come out on these little nozzles in the globe, and then the globe would spin. Which of Newton's laws is that? Which of Newton's laws does this thing illustrate? Remember Newton's law. Remember Newton's laws? We're going to do Newton's laws again, but let's see if you still remember <laughs> from, uh, what was this, about a week ago? Uh, it's been about a month ago. A month ago. Your minds are better than that. My mind's going, but not yours. Oh, come on. Which of Newton's laws does this illustrate? Third law, which is? Which is? First of all, you had one of three chances to get it right. But uh, third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So when the steam comes out of this nozzle in this direction, which way is this ball going to spin? It's going to spin the opposite way from where the gas has come out, right? Okay, so let's pretend that we're back in Greece, back in 60 BC, and uh, we have a hero's engine here that we built. 
We're going to show you, and we're going to make this thing work. And we fill this with some water. And we're now going to heat the water. Oh, that's cool. We're going to heat the water. I'm going to show you how here. Now, now, which way will this turn when the water turns into steam? The opposite way. The opposite way. It looks like a knife. Okay. So, everybody see this? How much water did you put in there, Carl? Okay, and here it's turning into steam. And now it's going to start... Go the other way. ...spinning this way. There she goes. Right? Is that the right direction? Yep. Hero's engine. Here we go. How fast can it go? Okay. Now, Hero built this as a... Uh, it's sort of nothing more than a toy. He actually didn't even understand Newton's laws, and he didn't even understand the principle of rockets. But this really is probably the, the, the first real kind of rocket that, that illustrated the principle of how rockets work. There was a lot of development went on in, in uh, China, and a lot of it, it revolved around the fact that the Chinese invented gunpowder about 800 AD. Gunpowder is something you can make from potassium nitrate, charcoal, and sulfur, and you mix it all together. And when you light this mixture, it burns and gives off a lot of gas, a lot, immense amount of gas coming off when you light it, and it burns very rapidly. If you then took that and you packaged it inside something with a little nozzle on the end, then you would funnel all of that gas into a very high-powered stream. And that's what the Chinese did, and they built fireworks out of this. They would actually take and pack these little tubes with gunpowder and had a little nozzle in the back, and when they lit it, the thing took off, and it, and it basically was a fireworks. They, they created these things called fire arrows, and they actually used them in one of their battles with the Mongols, um, and actually repelled them. So it works very well. You also could take all of this and you could stuff it inside something and have no outlet. And then what's going to happen when you light it? It's going to explode because you're going to get so much gas that it's going to explode. I actually shouldn't be telling you this, but I actually did this when I was a, a kid. My parents were not happy <laughs> because it went off in our garage. But, that's what makes good scientists very inquisitive. For many centuries, rockets were primarily used for warfare, because that's all we really did with them. And we still do it today, um, and we still you know, use them to fight a lot of wars, but we really also have used them in the, last, in the last 40 or 50 years. We've really used them for much more peaceful purposes and for much more defense kind of purposes. Everybody know what GPS is, right? Tells you exactly where you are on the face of the Earth. How do you think GPS works? Satellite. satellite. How many satellites? David knows all about that, right? I think it's 24. 24? Yeah. 24 satellites that rotate around the Earth. And they actually sit in what's called geosynchronous orbits. Yeah, they don't sit. They move they're, around. They're low Earth orbit. They're on the move all the time. They're always moving. When you have a GPS receiver, like you do in your car, you actually pick up signals from up to eight of these at one time. Well, you need at least three, but you can pick up more. And when you pick up a lot of them, what happens in that receiver is they take all the signals and mathematically they can then, what they call triangulation, they can figure out exactly where you are on Earth to a precision of like, even inches, I understand. Yeah, and a really good one. Incredibly when you can. precise. All of our communications, all the TV that you watch from broadcasting, all gets transmitted over satellites. The way we learn all about weather and what weather we're getting from California that's in California today and will probably hit here two or three days later, will all come from orbiting satellites. There are hundreds of satellites in orbit around the Earth 
performing all kinds of functions. And the way those satellites got there is because they got propelled up on rockets and then they got put into orbit. Okay? The International Space Station, which is now, they've been building that for 20 years? Yeah. Something like that. We've been bringing pieces up into space continuously and adding them on and now have this huge station flying, flying up in space. So all of space exploration and we're now, we, we, we've flown satellites to, to many different planets. We now have a satellite that's actually orbiting Mercury. Just orbited Mercury two days ago. And it's actually going to be exploring the surface of that planet. And why do we do all that? Because the more, the more we learn about where the Earth came from and the more we learn about how the planets operate and, and what's going on, the more we learn about science in general. The rocket science goes way back. Thought originally with this guy named Galileo um, in the in the 1500s, and and he developed what we call the property of inertia. You're going to see in a minute. Inertia is basically Newton's first law of motion. Okay. Sir Isaac Newton wrote this book in 1687 where he outlined what the three laws of motion are. And they all hold true today, and they're the basic principle that govern how rockets fly. And in the uh, early 1900s, Robert Goddard, he's considered the father of modern rocketry because he actually built a real rocket that actually flew. Yes, if I have someone going to the Haiti Heart Center, would you please call 2901? If you're going to the Haiti Heart Center, please call 2901. And he built the rocket that was the first liquid fuel rocket in 1926. And that's actually all the rockets we built today are based on the same principle of the rocket that he built. The rocket he built is pretty elementary. In fact, um, your rocket is actually probably going to fly better than his rocket did in 1926. Um, but this was a, a wireframe. What he had is he had his rocket engine at the top of the frame here, and at the bottom he had two tanks. And you'll see this is what all liquid rockets are all about. And what do the two tanks contain? What? They contain some kind of fuel that burns, whatever that is. And what's the other tank? Oxygen, because that's what you need to burn the fuel. So all liquid fuel rockets are basically based on having two tanks. A tank of fuel and a tank of oxidizer. Okay. Rocket development, though, really took off, so to speak, um, back in World War II. The Germans were responsible for much of the early work in rockets during World War II, and they built a rocket called the V-2, which was the first real rocket that could could deliver some kind of a payload over 200 miles away and was, was a real practical application of what Goddard developed. Um, at the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union um, took back like 50 rockets each from, uh, from Germany. We also took all the scientists from Germany and brought them to the United States and they actually started our rocket program. And then, in 1957, the first actual satellite was launched by the Russians, called Sputnik. You guys probably never heard of this. It goes way back. This is a satellite that was only this big. A very small satellite. And all it did is beep. Gave off a little beeping sound by radio. Um, but they put that in orbit. We followed that by our first satellite in 1958. Then we had the Apollo program which actually landed a man on the moon. You've probably all seen videos of that. We actually had a satellite that we flew on a rocket and then we, that traveled all the way to the moon and landed. And then part of it stayed on the moon and a part of it took off again from the moon and then um, came back to the US. Since then, we've had the, the shuttle program and the space station, which was really our attempt to make this much more commercialized and to have a, to have a, a rocket, a flying rocket.